Something a little embarrassing happened today while I was trying to make a video. Instead of making enough footage for one video, I ended up with enough footage for about three different videos. So rather than wasting any of that or trying to edit it all down into some super fast cutting different version, I said, you know what, I'll just roll this out over the next couple of days. So you can hit pause on your reading schedule. This is a perfect time to get caught up if any of you have missed. And for those of you that are caught up, don't worry. We're going to still have content for the next three days. We're going to camp out in John chapter 8 here for a little bit. And then what we'll do is just move on and I will give normal reading on Sundays for the next couple of Sundays. Then we'll be caught up and everything will be good. So have no fear. We'll still finish the Gospel of John before Easter and you're going to get a little bit of a deep dive here into John chapter 8. I really appreciate you hanging around with me as I figure out this whole YouTube thing. I'm still learning, so you're on the journey with me. These 40 days, it's the first 40 days that I've ever done video like this. Uh, I'm still trying to figure it all out, so thanks for being patient. And uh, man, if you have comments or suggestions, I would love to hear them because I want this channel to be beneficial to you especially as we come to the other side of 40 Days with Jesus. As I start off this conversation, I want to make sure that I emphasize that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. This is what 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about being God-breathed and that it's useful for a variety of things for training us in life and godliness. So I want to say first and foremost that I believe deeply in the inspiration and infallibility of Scripture. So with that said, let's dive into a conversation about how we have the Bible we do. As you open your Bible, you're most likely aware of the fact that the one that you have in front of you is not the original Gospel of John. That provides a number of hurdles that have to be crossed in order to get a Bible in front of us today. Somewhere along the line, it's been copied, it's been translated into different languages, and ultimately you're ending up with an English version that sits in front of you, whether that's on a smartphone, a tablet, or a book that you've been reading for 50 years. You recognize that it's not the Gospel of John that was written in the first century by somebody who knew Jesus. We trace all of this back through a series of manuscripts that go back ultimately to the original autographed copy of the first Gospel of John that was written. There are whole fields of scholarship that are geared toward getting the best translation of the Bible in front of you. In one of those fields, they look at the earliest documents. They're working with manuscripts, some, some of them that are just fragments, others that are entire copies of books, but they're trying to piece together as close as we can get to these original documents. We want to get as close as we can to the documents that were written in the first century. They were written on parchment and then copied and copied and copied because these are books that were being read consistently. They were passed around churches. The churches would read them out loud. People were studying them. The early church cared about the Bible. We don't have any original copies of any New Testament document, which really isn't surprising. These documents were passed around in the churches and read on a variety of occasions on Sundays as people got together. They were studying it as God's Word. Originally, the letters that Paul wrote were just letters. And think about the letters that you get in the mail. Now, we don't preserve things in quite the same way that they did then, but that's 2,000 years ago. That brings us to John 8, 1 through 11. This story most likely occurred in the life of Jesus is true because it demonstrates the character of Jesus, the nature of Jesus. It's consistent with all of the Gospels' portraits of Jesus. However, it most likely wasn't written by John or included in this place in the Gospel. This is something that was picked up and later inserted in as texts were copied and transmitted and Christian believers were looking for a place to put this story. Originally, the oldest documents that we have, those that are closest to the time of Jesus, don't have this passage here in John 8, 1 through 11. The narrative continues from 753 right in to 812. There is no break, and so it looks like this has been inserted later as a story testifying to the character and the nature of Jesus. 
There are a few other places that scholars have inserted it over time. Some even suggest that it was originally written by Luke because the language in the Greek reflects more of Matthew or Luke tradition rather than what we see in John. There are a few different Greek words that John really doesn't use. The language is structured a little bit differently than the rest of the gospel, and it points more towards something that should have maybe been included in Luke. However, when it was translated into the Vulgate and the Latin, it was placed here in John chapter 8, and that's been preserved in the West for the rest of history. So this is most likely a true story from the life of Jesus, but it was not included here in the flow of the narrative of John chapter 8. And we will see that as we pick up the story in verse 12 here in just a couple minutes. So we have a true story from the life of Jesus that the church wanted to preserve, and they were looking for a place to put it. And it has ended up here in John chapter 8. And this is the story of the woman caught in adultery. So what do we do with this passage? It reflects the character of Jesus. It most likely happened. It seems consistent with who Jesus is in all of the other Gospels. And yet, it obviously doesn't belong here in John chapter 8. Well, in the West, the church has hung on to it, and they've used it, and they have continued to, to preach from it, to teach from it. It's sometimes set off a little bit differently. A Good Study Bible will have a note on this passage telling you a little bit of what I've already shared in this video. Uh, and, you know, those kinds of notes and study Bibles are so helpful. And I think it's a good reason to go out and buy a good study Bible. However, I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that the Bible is still God's Word, even though a story like this has been inserted. I think we can trust the guidance of the Holy Spirit who inspired the authors to also guide the process of transmission. I personally don't get hung up on this. We can look at the document history of the Gospel of John and see when it began to be inserted there, and we can see where it was inserted in the Gospel of Luke. That tells us that the Christian community believed this was a true story of Jesus' life, and that it should be included in the good news that we tell others about who Jesus is and what he does. And maybe I don't preach from it as much as I would other things. The truth is that the story is still in scripture and it reflects the character of Jesus demonstrated throughout the rest of the gospel. Wow, that was a lot. For some of you, this has been like drinking from a fire hose and your brain is about ready to explode. For others, it's old hat and that's okay. But if it would be helpful for you if I made another video just talking a little bit about how we have the Bible that we have in front of us today as English speakers, then I would love to do that. Just let me know in the comments below and we'll make that video.